How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good, good. My name is Chad. I'm uh, the missions pastor here at FBC. And uh, tonight I get to be your substitute teacher. I'm just kidding. Kidding. Uh, I'm so happy to get to spend time with you guys. The problem is when Jason gives me an opportunity to preach, it kind of comes rarely. So I have a lot to say and a little time to say it. So I want to just jump in here. Um, We're talking about the different names of God that you find in Scripture over the last several weeks. And uh, last week we talked about the word Yahweh, the name of God Yahweh. And it really goes to, Jason talked about it being kind of his, it's almost his... uh, it is what it is. I am that I am, right? It's his to be kind of name. It's, it's just, uh, there's a lot of different ways to describe it in scripture. You see it all over the place. Everywhere you see the capital L-O-R-D, it's the translation of that word Yahweh, Lord, is all over. Well, tonight we're going to talk about a different one. Um, it's a name that you've probably heard many times. If you were around in the 80s, they had songs about it. And the name of this that we're going to talk about tonight is El Shaddai. Have you heard that before? Yeah, if you remember uh, Amy Grant and Daniel reminded me, Michael Card, if you remember Michael Card. uh, (laughs) People, I was like, Daniel, I haven't heard the name Michael Card in like 30 years, but uh, I do remember he was back there and they sang that beautiful song. And uh, and I want you to know this El Shaddai appears seven times in the Old Testament. And then the name Shaddai by itself appears an additional 41 times. And so the first place you see it is found in Genesis chapter 17, One and two, it says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Have you guys heard heard those verses before? So specifically, El Shaddai is is the name that's translated Lord God Almighty. And so you see it in a lot of different places in the Old Testament, and it's a really interesting uh, and significant name because it's it's almost his covenant name. Um, If you think about it like this, uh, when you sign your name on a contract, um, it it has a different meaning than when you meet somebody and say, hey, my name is Chad, right? Like when you, uh, for me and my signature, it's Chad C. Mason, and it's a little more formal, and people might ask what that C stands for. I'll let you guys figure that out some other time. And... uh, and, and, but, but the name that you write in that signature has a different kind of legal status. This is almost God's legal name. And when he says, I am the Lord God Almighty here to, to, to Abraham in Genesis 17, it's underlining that, that he is almighty. He has the power to accomplish his will without anyone else's help. You might say, how do you figure all that out, Chad? Well, I'm going to tell you. This is, the great, this is why we're here tonight. So you know the story of Abraham. It actually starts a little bit earlier in Genesis chapter 11. You find out that Abraham's dad, his name is Terah, begins to move his family. And he moves him a little ways and then he stops. And then it says the word of the Lord came to Abram before they changed his name to Abraham. And if you look at Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, um, it it says this. It says, the Lord God said to Abraham, this is Yahweh, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, that I am that I am, said to Abraham, go from your family, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's a really powerful promise of Yahweh to this man Abraham, right? Right? And and if you think about all the different pieces of that, that he would bless Abraham, that he would make his name great, that he would have a a nation, many would come from Abraham, and then all the peoples of the earth. Some people call this the fourfold blessing because there's personal blessings for Abraham, there's blessings to his family, there's blessings to other people, his extended family, and there's blessing to all the nations. But you notice it's not an if-then statement. Do you notice a lot of times when God makes promises, he says, if you will humble yourselves and pray, then I will heal your land, right? You know that this is not one of those. This is a promise made by Yahweh that says to Abraham, not on Abraham's merit, it's not an if-then, it's not if you, Abraham, are faithful, then I will. It says, Abraham, I'm gonna bless you, and anyone who blesses you, I'll bless. I'm gonna, and anyone who curses you, I'll curse. And all of the families of the earth will be blessed through you. The promise is entirely and completely on who? God. So Abraham, in faith, just lets God bless him. 
unless you read chapter 15. In chapter 15, Abraham says to the Lord, maybe you're not going to bring an heir through my own blood, so maybe it's this other guy that's living in my house. There's a baby born in my household. Is this the one from whom the promise is going to come? Because Abraham's faith, he was already an old man. He was 75 years old when God gave him this promise. And so Abraham says, Lord, is it me or is it through someone in my household? And God said, no, it's through your blood. So in chapter 16, Abraham just calms down and everything's good, right? No, chapter 16 gets worse. (laughs) Abraham's wife says, well, if it's not through someone born in your house and it's not going to happen through me, I guess I need to give you someone that you can have a baby with. And so you get this other crazy story where Abraham sleeps with Hagar, they have Ishmael, and then Sarah gets really mad at Hagar, and Hagar flees because Sarah's treating her bad, and Abraham loses a son, and a concubine, there's all kinds of just pain and trauma. Do you remember this story? So here's what I want you to see. God made a promise to Abraham, and he said, I will bless you, Abraham. And then Abraham thought, well, maybe he didn't mean what he said he did. Maybe I thought, maybe I was wrong. So he questioned it and thought he could take it in his own hands. And then he tried a second time. So when you get to chapter 17, when God says to Abraham, I am the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai. He's basically saying, stop trying to fulfill the promise in your own merit. I am all powerful and I can do this without you. It's a powerful thing, and it's almost like it's this covenant signature of God. Stop trying to do it on your own. I'm the one that will make this happen. That's a big deal, folks, because if you take that same promise of God that that God gave uh, Abraham in Genesis 12, that promise is the same one that the New Testament author ties all believers in Christ to the promise of Abraham. The the El Shaddai God that has the power to complete his promises is the same God that came in Christ Jesus to this planet. The one that promises to save us and redeem us and forgive us and to restore us. That's the same God and it's on him. It's not an if then, it's because he is powerful. God Almighty El Shaddai is the one who has promised to take care of you. Yeah, that's a big deal. And here's, the, here's why I want to, uh, to just, it's not just about us. It's not just about Abraham. The, the, the El Shaddai words were given to him to give him confidence that God has the strength and the power. It's the same thing I'm trying to give you tonight, that God has the strength and the power. But it's not just for Abraham. Do you remember the rest of that promise? It was for his descendants and all the families of the earth. Listen, we have this beautiful picture of a God that has created all of us. He's given every one of us his image. We're image bearers. Every single human on the planet is created in the image of God, and they represent him in a unique and powerful way. Now, most of them don't know that their creator made them, and and they're living in opposition to his, his desire for them. But he promises that from every family, every nation, every tribe, every language of the planet, that he's going to call to himself people, that the blessing of Abraham will be, will be uh, understood and, and, and redeem every single people on earth. And it's not because we're so good. It's not because you can accomplish his will for him. It's because he is enough. So did Abraham have to do anything? Well, yeah. But it wasn't his to make happen. It's God. So we get invited to participate with a God that can make this happen. And he says, I was going to do it with us and, and among us and through us. And we get this incredible, this incredible invitation where we get to go where God has invited us and be a part of the things that he is accomplishing with and through and around us. But it's his work. It's always been his work. We get to participate in his work and it, his power. You know, from the beginning, he has been working. El Shaddai, God Most High, God Almighty has been at work to bring people to himself from every language, tribe, and tongue, and nation. 
and it's on him to bring about the fulfillment of that promise. There are some people, I have three minutes left. (laughs) There are some people who think that we're on the cusp. We're at the end of redemptive history, some people say. You know, uh, when I started working in missions almost 20 years ago, there was a statistic that said there was over 3,500 people groups on the planet that were unengaged and unreached. It meant that they not only had no access to the gospel, but there was no one that we knew of that was even trying to get the gospel to them. 30 years ago, there was people that thought, no one's even trying for 3,500 people groups on the planet, representing almost 3 billion people. So no access and no one trying to give them access. In the last 30 years, you know how that number is today? 200. There's 200 unengaged, unreached people groups left on the planet. That means there's a church planted in 3,300 people groups that 30 years ago didn't even know the gospel existed. And I've been listening to this guy say, this is a huge, yeah. We may be closer to seeing the fulfillment of the Great Commission than any generation in history. I always hear people say, except for maybe the first generation, those first apostles, but I think we've surpassed even the impact that they had that first century. We are on the cusp. Some people say in the next decade, in the next decade, we could see a church, a Christian church established among every single people group on the planet, which means that every nation, tribe, and language would have access to the gospel. We may be the first generation in the history of the world, to see literally every people group be represented in in the Christian faith. That's a big deal. It makes my skin, maybe we're gonna be the ones to run that last lap, folks. Maybe we're gonna see God do, and and then it doesn't mean the, the work will stop. That doesn't mean every person gets access, but every people group will have access. We're right there. So I want you to see this, this, this promise from Genesis 12 that God has been working and fulfilling and calling his people to partner with him has been going on for at least 4,000 years, probably more like six to 8,000 years. And here we are, maybe we get to see it fulfilled in our day. What a good thing. So when you think El Shaddai, you should definitely think about that beautiful song from the 1980s. But beyond that, you should think about a God who is able to do what he says he's going to do. Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your message, for your word, for your names. God, how every one of those names gives us a different part of your character, helps us to understand more of who you are. And Father, we thank you so much that you remind us that you are the one that brings about your will. That Father, we participate, we get to aid, we get to assist, we get to be part But God, it is not because of us. It's because of you. Lord, be with us tonight as we go about our studies, God, as we um, move on to the other things that you've called us to. Help us to remember that our faith is not misplaced because you're the Lord God Almighty. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you go, a couple things. Thank you. Thank you for a couple little claps there. It's like the... It's like the... uh, (laughs) I feel like it's the, uh, it's like the consolation clap, like, all right, all right, all right. Um, so uh, the air conditioner is working now in the choir room, so the choir will go back to the choir. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Now that's going to get you good. Um, but the, the other class will also move over to the FLB. Um, the soul care class will be over there. Apparently, people like to sit at tables and take a lot of notes. And uh, Tim and the pastors are giving you guys lots of notes over there. Um, so there won't be anything happening in here after we close. You guys, have a wonderful night, and we will see you again uh, in a few minutes.